People have been asking me to look at the private company Helion Energy ever since it was profiled by a YouTube channel called Real Engineering. I'm not sure whether I can convince anyone of anything, since I only have a bunch of boring charts and no fancy 3D graphics, so there we go. Besides, I already discussed many of the challenges in my technical How Fusion Works series, so I will pull some clips out of there. In their video, Real Engineering claim that Helion Energy's Trenta machine is, quote, a closely guarded secret for years, end quote, even though the company have put up results on their own YouTube channel and reported them to the public agencies that they were originally funded by. Helion is reportedly using the Field Reversed Configuration, or FRC, approach to fusion. FRC machines have been built extensively since the 1960s, so this is absolutely nothing new, even though CEO David Kirtley said, quote, it's a real unique version of fusion fuel that Helion and very few others do, end quote. The first challenge for Helion is that they plan on using the deuterium-helium-3 reaction. This is a much less reactive fuel mix than deuterium-tritium, which is the reaction in most other approaches. As I said previously, Suppose we achieved good power output from a deuterium-tritium reactor. The tritium is a problem because it's hard to make and it gives off neutrons. So we decide to replace the fuel with a deuterium-helium-3 mix instead. This will absolutely clobber our power output when running at the same temperature as before. We could claw back some of that power if we up the temperature or density, but of course this increases the physics and engineering challenges. Note that in this case some neutrons would still be produced as deuterium nuclei would fuse with each other. In this plot, on the x-axis is the temperature in millions of degrees, and on the y-axis is the reactivity. I assumed that any commercial reactor would target at least 300 million degrees, but helium seems to be satisfied to have reached 100 million. At this temperature, they are 1,000 times less reactive than they could be if they went with a tritium option, or 5,000 times less reactive than a machine like JET at its operational temperatures. It is therefore extremely doubtful to me that they will ever generate energy gain. But hey, maybe venture capitalist funding gives you some sort of magic that will overcome this lower reactivity somehow. I did have a chuckle at how real engineering is wrong in their explanation of neutrons in the deuterium-tritium reaction, as if breeding tritium somehow loses the energy carried by the neutron. Also, the wording implying that tokamaks can only use deuterium-tritium was wrong. They could, and sometimes do, have helium-3 fusion. It's just that the plan in future is to use tritium for the previously stated reactivity reasons. The other problem with deuterium-helium-3 is the extreme amount of radiation which would be put out. Now granted, this reaction itself doesn't involve any radioactive materials whatsoever. However, if you have a mix of these two isotopes at thermonuclear temperatures, Pairs of deuterium nuclei will react with themselves and release neutrons. This is a factor which the real engineering video completely ignores, as if you could have a stern talk to the deuterium nuclei and order them to only react with helium and not with each other. Statistically, the chance that two deuteriums react is half of deuterium helium-3, and only half of the former reactions will produce a neutron directly. This means, at equal reactivity, one neutron is released for every four deuterium-helium-3 reactions. However, if you look back at the plot I showed before, at 100 million degrees, the deuterium-deuterium reactivity is seven times higher than deuterium-helium-3. You are therefore going to get a lot of neutrons when trying to actually produce electrical power. A neutron is about 10 times more deadly than a similar gamma ray, and unlike gamma rays, the neutrons will make other things radioactive after the machine is switched off. As I said previously, you must physically have roughly a meter of dense material around your fusion reactor. Because the neutrons are not charged, they are not slowed down unless they interact with a nucleus directly. You must therefore put enough atoms in their way to stop them. When a neutron is absorbed by any element other than lithium or beryllium, it will typically turn the stable nucleus into a heavier radioactive one. If the phosphorus in your DNA absorbs a neutron, it will turn into an unstable isotope which will then decay by means of beta emission and become a sulfur atom. I hope I don't need to say this, but both of these things are very bad for your DNA. Helium do not have a meter of solid material around their reactor to attenuate neutrons. If the Trenta machine, as pictured, were to be producing power plant levels of energy, it would be like the exploded Chernobyl reactor number 4. 
This problem is absolutely non-negotiable. If you are producing fusion energy from deuterium helium-3, you are generating a lot of corresponding neutrons and making everything radioactive. Even at higher plasma temperatures, where the balance of these two reactions I talked about is more favorable towards the helium one, you would still be at dangerous neutron levels. Even if everything goes as planned, they will need a nuclear-rated facility, radiation shielding, a tritium separation plant, which at ITER is probably about the size of Helion's entire building, and a lot of other infrastructure. And what about that innovative way they generate electricity from the plasma itself? Well, as I said previously, the problem is that accelerating charges emit photons by a process called Bremsstrahlen, or breaking radiation in German. This is not noticeable for the kind of speeds we experience in everyday life, but it is significant for the kind of motion required for nuclear reactions. A plasma is constantly radiating away energy by Bremsstrahlen, with everything from radio waves to X-rays. Once they are emitted, the photons usually, though not always, leave the plasma and energy is lost. So again, quite a bit of the energy will be lost as heat, and the energy gain in the plasma reaction itself would have to be large to compensate. I'm also skeptical about their claim that particle gyro radii are larger than predicted by theory. There have been many plasma physics experiments and observations which confirm the size of the gyro radius. More likely, they are seeing losses due to particle drifts and turbulence, which I have described in another video. I have reservations about exactly how they know the plasma conditions they have achieved. A casual check doesn't show many actual peer-reviewed papers by them. Just so you know, any publicly funded experiment spends a lot of time and effort debating, designing, documenting, and running the diagnostics which determine plasma properties. I guess you have to combine therapy with diagnostics to get the really big bucks, though. Anyway, that was just me complaining. Helion are totally going to prove me wrong in the future space year 2021 when they prove commercial energy gain in a 50 megawatt system. I know, because it says so in this totally uncritical article.